Hello, Graydon. Welcome to Better Tech. Let's have a quick introduction about yourself and what you do for our audience, and we'll dive right into the topic then. Sure. My name is uh, Graydon McKee. I have spent a little over 20 years in the uh, information security industry. I have worked in all sorts of different places and, uh, and, and around the world. Uh, came up doing some, some work with the U.S. federal government out of Washington, D.C., and then I sort of went on to, uh, to the big four and made my way out to the West Coast, worked for Apple and uh, Microsoft, and um, now I'm back being a uh, CISO for a small company in Texas. Right. So, great. And our topic for today is cybersecurity and more specifically the role of the chief information security officer. So what we'll do is we'll kind of, you know, have a look around like cybersecurity trends in 2020 and trends ahead for like 2022 and beyond. So recently we've been experiencing increasing data breaches. What do you think that has taught companies? What do I think has, has what? It has taught companies, like considering oh. the recent data breaches that companies globally have been facing, what lessons do you think companies have learned? And it can happen to anybody. Uh, so it's things that we've been saying in the industry for quite some time, but I think that really it comes down to, um, it's really sinking home, you know, kind of the widespread nature of what's going on, everything from, you know, uh, ransomware to, you know, full on hacking and, and those sorts of things. I think that companies are realizing that uh, just because, uh, you know, they don't feel that they have anything anybody else would, would like to, to take from them that, uh, um, you know, that they're kind of getting a, a wake up call now, so. Right. So how do you think uh, a CIO is different from that of a C CISO and a CEO? And why do you think companies today more so than before need a CISO? So CISO, uh, the responsibilities that, that we have are really focused on protecting the sensitive data that, uh, that our companies hold and, and, and operate, be it uh, proprietary information that's internal or be it, um, you know, uh, private information about customers and, and those sorts of things or just customer data. So we're responsible for, I would say, a much wider swath of of responsibility than your typical CIO. Now, if you ask one of my colleagues who's a CIO, they would probably disagree with me. But what I would say is most CIOs are responsible for the availability of the systems in which they're operating. Uh, the ownership of the data using those systems is typically a business unit or something like that. And here's where I say that I have a kind of a larger responsibility than, than a typical CIO which is that I'm responsible for not only the, the technical aspects as to what's going on, but really the business processes as, as well. As an information security officer, it's, it's all about the data. It's about where it resides. Somebody prints out something and leaves it on their desk. Well, that's no longer a, an IT thing. It's an actual physical object. I, I'm still responsible for the information that, that's on that piece of paper. Uh, you know, what goes into a trash, what goes into a burn bag, you know, those sorts of things, what goes into a shredder. Um, and a CTO, uh, generally, as the way that I'm seeing it now, are, are the, the, uh, the executives that are setting the, the, the uh, pace for technology for the entire company. And so they, they as well as uh, I, have a, have a little bit brighter or a, 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 a broader view as to what's going on. Um, and where they're setting that right. particular direction, but it's, it's more technology based and, and I'm kind of in a process business process as well as technology based field. And why does somebody oh, need one? Yeah. Um, it really comes down to a resiliency sort of a uh, piece. So, you know, I'm talking to a wide swath of, of different types of companies. If you, if you have sensitive information that that is that you rely upon in which to to operate your uh, company you owe it to yourself to have an information security professional help you go about protecting that uh, even if you don't feel that it's a value to anybody else if you get hit with ransomware uh, and that information becomes unavailable to you uh, and then you can't operate your particular you know uh, you know uh, company um, that's going to have you know quite a uh, you know quite a big uh, 
quite a lot of repercussions uh, with, with regards to, you know, keeping yourself operational. So, you know, even from a resiliency standpoint, of course, if you're holding on to other people's information and that's information that can be resold, uh, you know, you're also talking about, you know, a responsibility to your customers, not only a fiduciary one, but a moral one. So, um, you know, as to, you know, what's happening with their uh, information and their sensitive, you know, information, if you're holding on to like healthcare information, um, you know, what tests people are going for and those sorts of things, what the results of those tests are is a very sensitive subject. So, you know, um, I think everybody deserves to have an information security professional advise them at some way, shape or form. You could be looking mm -hmm. at a fractional CISO or a virtual CISO, which might be coming in for a small number of, of, of hours to sort of help you set up what you need to do if you don't need them uh, full time. Where it could be a, a, a full blown, you know, hundred percent position, but I think everybody would would benefit from, and in some way, shape, or form, from engaging with uh, with a type of a CISO. Right. So, Graydon, the importance of having a CISO in a company is definitely growing. But you see that so many tech companies don't exactly have that position per se. So, why do you think that is? Because they think they can do it themselves. Um, they might have uh, security people. You, know, you could have a director of information security. They don't have the title of CISO, but they have mm -hmm. the same responsibilities. And that's fine. Um, what you're looking for is somebody to help guide your company. You could have people who feel that, you know, hey, I've been doing IT for 30 years or 25 years. I know what security is all about. That's true. Um, and depending upon what sort of situation that, that you're in, it could be just fine to, to operate that, that way. But as an information security professional, I've spent my career focusing on the whys and the wherefores and, and the hows to protect this particular information. And so I feel I'm a little bit more specialized than, than just your typical IT guy. Um, the, though I would say the best information uh, security guys are the guys who were IT guys who actually understand how everything operates and all of that. And I come out of a networking background, network ar architecture, that sort of thing before I got involved in information uh, security. So, you know, I feel like I can sit down and kind of talk about, you know, packet movements and packet captures and busting packets open and those sorts of things. And, you know, system administration and, and all of that from, you know, from my past life doing that, um, as opposed to somebody who comes into information security, merely from an audit capability who might not understand everything. So, um, you know, that's where I think people are, are, are coming from is they might be using a, uh, a person who's been their, their IT person for a while. So if the perfect CISO is a bit of both a business person who can talk directly to the CEO, explain the necessity for security and risk mitigation, but then also talk to customers perhaps when other employees about security and how the role is important to the company, where are these people coming from? Where are they getting all of this education? So people are coming from just about everywhere. Um, like I said before, you'll get people coming out of IT, you'll get people coming out of an audit function, um, you'll get other people coming out of other business functions. Um, education really comes from a number of places. You can go out and get certified. There's a number of uh, college courses now that, uh, that you can go and get degrees in. I have a master's degree in information assurance. Um, and so we talked a lot about that bridging the gap uh, between the technical and the executive boardroom during my master's program. So there's a lot of education that's out there. Uh, some people are just learning what they need to do through trial and error. And if depending upon the type of organization they're in, that's okay. Um, but what really comes down to is that, you know, people need to understand that um, security is a factor in business decisions. It is not the only factor in business decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like kind of, you know, I guess the uh, biggest thing is uh, some people come into the security realm because they think things are very black and white. Whereas I would say that 98% of, of what we're dealing with in information uh, security and what I deal with as a CISO is, is really a shade of gray. There's very little that's, that's, that's black and white. And so you need to be able to understand what's going on, be able to communicate the risks, and then to be able to turn and and operate even when a decision has been made that you don't necessarily agree with. So if I come to a CEO with, with a risk, 
and the CEO looks at it and we have a, a long conversation about it and they decide to, to make a decision to accept the risk, um, you know, whereas I think that they should do something to, to mitigate the risk, that's fine. Um, you know, I still need to go back and, and do what I've been asked to do, which is to mitigate that particular risk uh, or, or to help, you know, bolster what, what they've decided to do to, to accept the risk. Um, and so you really need to have, you know, a lot of experience. And I would say, you know, mentorship in this particular line of business is, is an important thing to do. You know, learn from those that have gone before you. And speaking of that, are you seeing some best practices being followed by companies in the industry that really helps kind of, you know, get to where you're talking about you have to have this like mentorship and understanding and everything? I think that that's a kind of a tough question. There is no best practice for how to raise a CISO up, you know, from a rank and file so security person to a CISO level. I think it really comes down to management style. And the more that, that people realize that, um, you know, um, that management is, is more of a, a communicative uh, or a, uh, it's a, it's a cooperative sort of a thing. You know, you don't just, a manager isn't just the person that comes in, tells you what to do and make sure that, that it's done. It's, it's, it's sitting down to really understand the people that you have working for you, what, what motivates them, how to get the best out of them. Um, and, and how to make sure that, that they're satisfied in those types of environments, then yes, the mentorship is already there because you have managers actually fulfilling that role to, to better the lives of the people who are underneath them while they're actually performing the uh, job. If you're in a role um, where you, you have a manager who just wants to kind of tell you what to do, set it off, those sorts of things, it's a little bit harder to kind of work on, on your own. And I think that um, in, in, in those you know, instances, there are some um, professional organizations that are out there. Like I'm a CISSP and I have been for quite some time. And so we have a professional organization as part of that particular certification where we can get involved in different discussion groups and those sorts of things where we can bounce things off of each other. There's a lot of meetings that go on in a lot of the major cities around the country and, and around the world where you have different security organizations coming together to have a little okay. bit of a networking event. Those are things that I think uh, people can seek out if their companies can't support them that way. Right. And coming to the current landscape, we see that technology has transformed the internet age into a period of cruel miracles for security professionals. All of these um, cruel miracles are that we have devices in every pocket. We can go anywhere, we can talk to anybody at any time, and we can do it at the speed of a lightning bolt. But at the same time, if you're a CISO, how do you secure all of it? That's a couple hour conversation. So let me boil that down into just a couple of minutes. Um, really, the industry term that we're using now is, um, is a zero trust technology uh, architecture. It's just another way to say what a lot of us have been saying for years. I certainly didn't come up with the idea, but I adopted it in, in that you don't trust any device uh, that, that's connecting with, with your sensitive information. You really have to okay. take a look at what's going on. And so you're right, there are technologies and tools out there for mobile devices and, and tablets and, and you know, watches even and those sorts of things that are out there. Um, that's where I would be looking from a technological standpoint, but you know, really starting to embrace that zero trust architecture is, is the way to go in today's day and age. Okay, and then when it comes to kind of protecting all of this information, the job of a, CIO, a CISO is also to, you know, like um, convey all of these things in a, like a company-wide and everything like that. So how do you maintain that balance of sharing that information, but at the same time, you know, uh, containing some of it to yourself? Well, I shouldn't be con uh, containing anything to myself uh, when it comes to what, what we're protecting. Um, okay. you know, I don't necessarily need to tell the rank and file exactly you know, what the encryption algorithm is on, on the database, of course. But um, you know, my, my job is also to educate everybody that I'm dealing with with regard to information security. That could be customers, that could be partners, that could be employees, that could be peer groups, all of that sort of thing. Um, and it's really to understand what your audience is. And the big thing for information security people is not to, um, 
force people to to learn our language. I mean, let me put it that way. Like if you're talking to somebody and they don't, you know, you need to learn how to speak their particular language, understand where they're coming from and those sorts of things. Uh, you, we really need to take the time to understand, you know, what is important to them so that as we are talking about information uh, security, we can translate in our own minds, you know, what that, you know, what that needs to be for our particular audience. So if I'm talking to a group of developers, I'm going to be speaking about things a little bit more differently than I would to IT people than I would to just the rank and file like clerical staff, right? Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to speak about different things. It's just as important what I'm saying to each group. Uh, I'm just going to do it in different ways. And so that, that would be, you know, what we need to be doing. Okay. And lastly, Graydon, do you see companies adopting automation first, perhaps in security, where they may have been more hesitant than they were in other parts of the business? Yes. Um, so automation is going to be a big thing. We, we've, you know, we've been dealing with this lack of, you know, skilled people to come into our industry. We have many more jobs that are open than we have people to actually fill them. Um, and there's a lot of things that, that we can start to do um, you know, from an automation standpoint. Um, now, we need to be very careful when we adopt automation to understand that, you know, exactly what, what's going to happen and what, what gets triggered. But we can really start to reduce the amount of lower level work that we need to do through an automated uh, platform. And we can free our analysts up to then focus on more higher level things. Um, I think that you're going to see more and more of that in the, in the next several years. Um, it is something that, uh, that I'm embracing, um, though with a little bit of trepidation, you know, when you start to automate things, you know, they're happening without somebody making that decision. So we need to be able to, to, to trust what we're doing. Um, but I think if we just, you know, take a, you know, a, a measured approach, everything will be fine. Right. And that great and brings our episode to a close. Thanks so much for joining us on Better Tech. Thank you very much.